uh, and want to look with us this morning. Uh, finishing up 11th chapter of the book of John this morning. It, it's been a, I looked back earlier and uh, five messages out of the 11th chapter of the book of John, but I, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed what uh, God's brought to us in this, this passage. It's one of the uh, the most familiar chapters, stories about Lazarus, I guess, uh, that, that's in the Bible. One of the great miracles, one of one of three that Jesus raised uh, literally from the dead while he was here uh, on earth. And uh, it's just one of those that, that just was anchor points. But uh, <clears throat> there's a, a message this morning in the last part of this chapter and I honestly don't know that I've ever heard anybody preach it. Uh, it it's, it's one of those that when you go to the 11th chapter of John, you preach Lazarus and you don't really pay a lot of attention to the rest of the chapter. But uh, there's a message here. Uh, and, and I hope uh, we open our ears and, and hear what God would say to us this morning. Beginning in the 47th verse is where our passage picks up this morning. Remember last week uh, where we left off, uh, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, and I don't go back and read the last two verses that I read last week. Uh, verse 45 says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen these things which Jesus on him. So many folks that was there in the crowd believed on Jesus. Verse 46 says, But some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. So you had some that believed, some that went and uh, told on him, I guess, if you want to call it that. Uh, and then verse 47, it says, Then gathered uh, the chief priest and the Pharisees a council and, and said, What do we? For this man hath many miracles. So this is the Sanhedrin uh, that's gathered together. The Sanhedrin was the ruling council of the day. Uh, when you see the, the chief priest, uh, <clears throat> there was only one high priest uh, of the, the, the church, the, the Jewish community, but the chief priest were made up of kind of retired high priest. Now, they didn't retire, they got retired. Uh, you've got to kind of understand what's happening. Uh, the, the high priest was heir to that, that line. He, they, they, they followed a, a line of succession by lineage, uh, Aaron being the first high priest. And uh, so it, it was uh, appointed, uh, you were born into that role. But when the Romans came in and took over Jerusalem, some of the high priests that was there didn't suit their needs, so they removed them and put their own high priest in, and they still followed the, the line, but or the tribe, uh, the, the Levi, because uh, the Jews wouldn't have it if they hadn't, but they put their own high priest in. Uh, so the chief priest was some of those, and they the chief the high priest was also supposed to serve for life, sort of like our Supreme Court, uh, and the Romans let them serve as long as they was favorable to them. As long as they was doing their cause, they were there, they were good. If When they started doing things that the Romans didn't like, they said, all right, you're out, we're going to put another one in. So uh, the chief priest was kind of made up of a council because they, they still ha had high regard. The Jews still had high regard for those people because they were still uh, filling the role of the priest, uh, uh, but they just wasn't the high priest. So when you see that chief priest, you kind of know, you know, they, they still had a standing amongst the Jews. Uh, and, and they, they may it. And they and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, made up a council called the Sanhedrin. And that's the council that, that met together right here. And they said, what shall we do? Well, what do we do? Uh, for this man has many miracles. They, 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 they're, they're realizing that they've got a problem. Uh, they, they've got a problem with Jesus because he's uh, creating a, a, a bunch of followers. There's been a bunch of people saw this miracle 
And they're afraid they're going to have an insurrection uh, and Jesus is going to be right there. Notice their concerns. Verse 48 says, if we let, let him thus alone, all men will believe on him and the Romans shall come into both our place and nation. That, that's important. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest the same year, said unto them, ye know nothing at all. Now, that statement is just prophetic because he's fixing to say something that he don't even know what he's fixing to say. He says, nor consider that it is <clears throat> expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And thus he spake not of himself, but being a high priest, <clears throat> but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation and not for that nation only, but also he should gather together in one the children of God that <clears throat> were scattered abroad. From that day forth, they took count together of him to death. Jesus, therefore, walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near into the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they Jesus for Jesus, and spake among themselves as they should in the temple. What think ye that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. If correctly read, that's verse 47 through verse 57, the 11th chapter of the book of John. And we want to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. I'm going to ask Brother Jeff. If you would, lead us this morning. <clears throat> so we've got, uh, basically on the opening of this passage, we've got the, the, the council meeting together. And, and, and you can just hear uh, these uh, old, old, old scholars sitting around saying, what are we going to do with this man? He's creating a ruckus. He's getting, he's gaining a following. He's getting those that uh, that didn't know anything about him. Now they've seen him raise uh, Lazarus. It said they've done many miracles, and he said if we leave him alone, the Romans are going to come. Now what this passage to us, it gives us an excellent uh, object lesson about unbelief and opposition to Christ. It's repeated every time that a man, woman, boy, or girl uh, dismisses the, 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 the pounding, the, the, the salvation that Jesus wants to bring them because it's repeated because we make a deliberate rejection and oppose Christ every time uh, that we know that we're not in a right relationship with Him. Uh, and we, we, we see just like the council and just like the, 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 the men here of this day, they recognized that Jesus had done many miracles. They recognized that, that, that he was something different, uh, but they didn't want to lose what they had. Notice uh, that that's the reason that they didn't want to, to turn from them. He said that the Jews, he said that, that, he said if we leave this man alone, uh, all men will believe on him and the Romans shall tum, come and take away both our place and our nation. See, the basic reason for people turning a deaf ear to the message, the gospel message, and not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is basic self-centeredness and fear. They're afraid of what they're going to lose. They don't realize what there is to gain, but they're afraid of what they're going to lose. Here, this council uh, had, had some standing with the Romans. They had some things that they didn't want to lose. They, uh, notice it says uh, that, that they uh, would lose their place in their nation. They didn't want to lose their people. How many folks have made the decision not to follow Christ because they didn't want to lose their friends or who they thought was their friends? Uh, they didn't want to uh, come into a, 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 a weird relationship with their neighbors. 
Ah, you know old Joe over there, he done went and followed Jesus. He's one of them Jesus freaks now. They, they didn't want to, you know, folks, they, they don't want to lose the relationships they've got. Not only the relationships they've got, but they don't want to lose their place. Here's the council said, we'll lose our place. I've got a little bit of authority. I've got a little bit of standing. But in Jesus, I'll lose that. It's not a good for my business if I follow Jesus. All these excuses just play out time and time and time again. And we see it right here with the Sanhedrin, uh, the council of the Pharisees and the chief priests uh, that came together. And they're offering excuses of why uh, they've got to do something with this man called Jesus. But they were also afraid of losing their nation. Notice it says we'll lose our place and our nation. Uh, their, their nation uh, was based on uh, religion uh, that, that's what the Jewish nation was all about. But by this time, uh, the, the religious tradition and the rituals had become more important to these men than a right relationship with God. <laughs> and I wonder this day and time if we don't, uh, a, a lot of church folks uh, that don't have a, a, an understanding, a, 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 a free pardon of sin understanding with Jesus Christ, uh, uh, they go through the motions. Uh, uh, they go through a religious tradition. Uh, uh, they go through a religious act. Uh, uh, but they don't know uh, the one and only true and living God. Uh, uh, and they're afraid that if they, if they get to know the true and living God, he'll mess something up. Uh, uh, they've got a good thing going. Uh, uh, they got an understanding. They got a, a position. Uh, uh, if they get saved and they get uh, uh, on fire for the Lord, uh, uh, then they might lose something and they don't want to do that. So they'd rather stick with the status quo uh, and deny uh, the only one that, that's able to get them into heaven. And that's exactly what these people were doing. Uh, a, a, a religious air about them, but uh, the, the traditions and the rituals had become more important than having a relationship with God. And if we're not careful, religion will get in our way of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't, don't ever let religion stand between you and a right relationship with God. I, I may have told the story before, but I, I met a man several years ago, and the second time I met him, he said, you're not like most preachers I know. And I said, well, I, is that, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. And he said, oh, that's a real good thing. He said, most preachers I know has got religion. And he said, I can tell you've got a relationship. And I took that as a compliment. Uh, because uh, religion uh, won't get you anywhere. Uh, but a relationship with Jesus Christ will get you into glory. Uh, uh, when this thing's over with down here, uh, uh, and, and time is no more, uh, a right relationship is what I'm counting on. Uh, uh, it's the only thing that I know, uh, uh, because Jesus Christ is the only one. Uh, uh, the Bible says He. there's been one name given uh, among men whereby we must be saved, uh, and that's the name of Jesus. Uh, so here, uh, the chief priests and the Pharisees, this council, uh, had decided that there was some things that they had in their life uh, that was more important than having a right relationship with Jesus. Uh, and they were afraid they were going to lose those things if they become uh, followers of Christ. Mark, the fourth chapter in the 19th verse, the Bible describes this way. It says, "...in the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choked the word." And it became unfruitful. Out of the parable of the sower. And that's exactly what happens a lot of times. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. What did Paul tell Timothy? He said, he, he, he wrote Timothy and he warned Timothy about Alexander the coppersmith. He said, beware of Alexander the coppersmith because he's done me much harm. Because he has followed this world and not Christ. We, we've got to be careful. We've got to be on guard. We've got to pay attention. Paul told Timothy also in 1st, 2nd Timothy chapter 3, 
uh, verses 1, the first part of 2, he said, This know also that in the last perilous time shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Uh, uh, that, that if we don't uh, recognize that in this day and time, I don't know what is. Uh, I, I don't know how many of y'all have been watching the news the last few nights, uh, uh, but it's just sickening to me uh, uh, because they'll go in and they'll tear up uh, city after city uh, in the name of justice, and there's no more justice being done for, because of that than anything thing in the world. Uh, uh, the justice can only be done where uh, the crime was committed and they're using that as an excuse uh, uh, to just uh, pillage and, and, and ride and tear up uh, because they've got their own agenda. They're lovers of their own self. Uh, uh, how in the world is stealing the TV uh, uh, justify somebody uh, d- getting justice for somebody over here that kills somebody? Uh, the two is as opposite as they can absolutely be, and it's just they're doing it uh, whatever they want to do and using it, uh, trying to find a, a name to do it in. But they're doing it because of their own lust and their own greed, and it's sin, and you can't call it anything else. And Paul told Timothy that we'd see that, uh, we'd see that happening in the last days. Lovers. Of their own selves. Luke the ninth chapter. Jesus says in the 23rd verse. He says and he said unto them all. If any man will come after me. Let him deny himself. And take up his cross daily and follow me. That didn't like what the Sanhedrin was doing. It didn't sound like they were denying themselves. They said if we don't do something with this man. We're going to lose our place. We're, we're going to lose influence. We're going to lose our position. But Jesus said, deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. For whatsoever, whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, can, uh, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he should gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? So uh, Paul or Jesus asked us the question, what, what do we gain? If we gain the whole world, and in another place in Scripture, he says, what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? How long is everything in this world going to last? If we're talking about material possessions, uh, we talked earlier this morning that they don't last near as long as they used to. Everything that's made wears out. Uh, everything that you're working so hard to accumulate, everything that you're working so hard to, uh, to, to show for, the Bible says it's where rust and moth does corrupt. But Jesus said, work for that which is eternal. Work for that that, that is, is never going away. And the Sanhedrin and the, uh, the, the chief priest, the high priest even, Supposed to be the ones leading the country in religious affairs are scheming to how to come up and do away with Jesus. But Caiaphas, the high priest, notice what he says. Verse 49 says, And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all. And then... He prophesies, he, he, he <clears throat> steps into the role of prophet and he doesn't even realize it. Because John adds the footnote in verse 40, 51 <clears throat> that he spake he not of himself. Meaning he didn't come up with this on his own. He said, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. So notice what Caiaphas said. He said, now considering... <clears throat> that it is expedient for one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. You know, that almost sounds exactly like what Jesus had been saying. Jesus said <clears throat> in John the 11th verse of the 10th chapter, He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Caiaphas is saying <clears throat> that it's needful, my word, that one man should die instead of the whole nation perishing. 
Caiaphas was looking at it from his standpoint. He wanted to keep his people. <clears throat> he wanted to keep influence over his people. He wanted to keep his rule and his authority. Not not be uh, not let the Romans come in and tell him that he wasn't useful anymore and replace him. <clears throat> but he wanted to keep control. So he said, "We need we need to kill one man." <laughs> We need to kill this man, Jesus, that everybody else won't perish. But he didn't realize that was the plan. He didn't realize that's what God had in, intended to start with. <clears throat> Turn over to Second Peter if, <clears throat> if you can. Our throat's just about gone this morning. And we've got, <clears throat> I, I guess it's allergies going on and uh, pollen's rising up and our, our throat's just, just about gone. Second Peter <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says, But there were faults among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Caiaphas didn't realize what he was even saying. But here, the high priest is coming up with a scheme to kill the Son of God. If that's not being a false prophet, I don't know what it is. So here we see what's going on. He introduces to them the, the, the thought of a substitutionary death uh, that Jesus had already been preaching. And they didn't even realize it. Jesus came to save not only the Jew, but also the Gentile. Notice verse 52. John writes and he says, And not for that nation only, but for also he should gather together in one children, in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. So we realize that this was the plan. Uh, the Bible tells us that it was set down before the foundation of the world, and, and and this is how the whole thing fell into place. It's always been kind of a sad commentary to me that it was the high priest and those that were supposed to be the religious leaders of the day that came up with a plan to crucify our Lord. You know, it, it, it just seems like it would have been the outsiders. It seems like it would have been those that uh, that didn't like his message because of the way they were living, instead of those that didn't like his message because they were afraid they he'd mess up their apple cart. But here we see what's going on. Jesus uh, is dying for the entire nation, not only the nation of Israel, but also for all the Gentiles. And Paul said in Romans 1 and 16, he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So that's the plan. That was what God had in, in mind from the founding. Uh, but here, this council had got to Sanhedrin, had, had come together and the plan had been uh, pl plotted and the decision had, had been made and Jesus has been rejected. John, the first chapter in the 11th verse, the Bible says that He came to His own and His own received Him not. We, we just see that coming for full fruition. John, the 8th chapter in the 24th verse, Jesus said, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. And that's the, the message that He gave to the Sanhedrin. That's the message that He gave to the Pharisees. That's the message that He gave to every one of us. That if we don't believe, we'll die in our sins. So what did Jesus do? <laughs> <clears throat> wasn't difficult for Jesus to make the decision. Notice in verse 53, it says, Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put Him to death. 
Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into the country near the wilderness unto a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. Jesus withdrew from those that rejected him. I want you to just to let that pause just a minute. Jesus withdrew from those that rejected him. He still does the same thing. The Bible teaches us that it's <clears throat> that that the Holy Spirit appeals to you. And want you to have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And I believe every person that's ever lived, every person that will ever live, has that opportunity at least one time. And the Bible teaches me, by the grace of God, uh, He hadn't come yet. The long-suffering of Jesus. And it's only by His grace that the Holy Spirit comes the second time. And the third time, knocks at that old heart's door. And you understand, you feel that on the inside, and you know that you're not in a right relationship with God, and it's the Holy Spirit wanting you to know that. Because Jesus, the Bible says in Revelation, He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Any that would come, that would open up to me, I'll come in and I'll sit with Him. But Jesus literally shows us what He does. He doesn't force Himself on anybody. He could have walked into that Sanhedrin council and just like He shook the fig tree down, He could have walked in that Sanhedrin council and began to strike the priests and the Pharisees down and make them mute and make them uh, have His own way in that meeting. But He didn't do that. Bible says from that day forward he walked no more openly among the Jews but went to the wilderness a city called Ephraim he withdrew Folks if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal savior and the Holy Spirit is dealing with you it's a scary place to get when he quits dealing with you Don't go that far Don't go to the point to where Jesus withdraws. Come and accept Him as what He's done. Acknowledge that that He's uh, the Savior of the world, the Messiah that should come. Romans, the 28th verse, Paul says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things which are not convenient. I'm just going to tell you, when I watch... The chaos that I've watched on the news the last couple of nights. I see a people that God has turned over to a reprobate mind. To do the things. What what does Paul say? To do those things which are not convenient. It, It just don't even make sense. The evil that they're doing. I, I, I can't for the life of me fathom a group of people that thinks there's something right with burning their own city down. Going in and destroying the business that they expect to go to the next day and buy their groceries. Folks, there's something wrong with that. There's something mentally disturbing to those people that destroy where they go to get their livelihood at. And the only answer that I can come up with is that God has turned them over to a reprobate mind. And that means a mind filled with Satan himself. Who else could convince you that the place you know you go buy your you groceries and uh, your shampoo and whatever else you need is the place you need to go destroy? There, there's no logic there. But that's what they do. In city after city after city. 
Genesis 6 and 3. The Bible says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for in that also, <clears throat> for that he also is flesh, yet his days be a hundred and twenty. And we know that was pre flood, and the days of man are not a hundred and twenty anymore, very often. So Jesus withdrew, drew close to his disciples. First Corinthians one and nine says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice as he withdrew from the people, it says the end of verse fifty four it said he continued. He he remained with his disciples. The Bible teach me that God said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. He's given us a promise that in the the chaotic world that we even live in today, He wouldn't leave us. You know, God's timing is is perfect. The providence of God is seen fulfilled right here. It it says the Jews' Passover was was nigh at hand. Many of the people went up out of the countryside into Jerusalem for the Passover to purify themselves. So a lot of people come to Jerusalem that normally wasn't there. Here's the Sanhedrin, got everybody out looking for Jesus. And the people have heard about Lazarus. They've heard that Jesus raised him from the dead. And they're all seeking for him. (laughs) Folks, you just can't make this stuff up. Here's the Sanhedrin looking for him to kill him. Here's the people looking at him to see what kind of miracle he's going to do. Everybody in Jerusalem's looking for Jesus, and he's went out the back door. He's waiting till it's time. John said in First John chapter, he said, "That which we have seen and we've heard, declare we unto you." that you may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship was with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. John wrote and preached and got exiled on the Isle of Patmos for the preaching and the writing. And he said, the reason I'm doing this, he said, We've seen it and we declare it unto you that you might have fellowship with us. And he said, if you've got fellowship with us, you've got fellowship with the Father. (laughs) And you've got fellowship with His Son. Because that's the only fellowship we've got. I, I, I don't know your hearts and your minds this morning. There's a lot of things going on in this world that I can't explain. There's a lot of things go on in personal lives that I can't explain. The timing of the raising of Lazarus and the Sanhedrin meeting and all these Jews coming from all over the countryside to Jerusalem couldn't be explained other than through God's providence. The Bible teaches us in the book of Romans, the 8th chapter and the 20th. And he says, And we know all, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. We don't always understand why things happen the way they happen. Uh, I, I, I just imagined those folks that was with Jesus didn't understand it either. <clears throat> mentioned it, I think, maybe last week, a week before, that, that Thomas, we always give him a hard time, oh, oh doubt and Thomas. But when Jesus said, I'm going back to Jerusalem or close to Jerusalem to Bethany, 
to raise Lazarus up. And the other, Jew, the other disciples were saying, <clears throat> you know they're trying to kill you if you go back over there. They don't kill you if you go over there. Thomas stood up boldly, I think, by all I can read and study. He looked at the disciples and he said, let's go to Jerusalem. And we'll die with Him if that's what it takes. Thomas sold out to Jesus. He didn't understand what was going on. He he didn't understand the ramifications of Him going and raising Lazarus from the dead. But by Him raising Lazarus from the dead is what got all these Jews to witness that. If you know the two times He raised somebody from the dead, one time He even told everybody to get out. (laughs) The other time He did it from a distance. So this was the only time that a, a, a crowd of people witnessed Him raising somebody from the dead. That was the key that turned the wheels in motion. For Jesus to be crucified. And Thomas is sitting over there saying, well, let's, let's just go with him. <laughs> let's back him up. I wonder if Thomas <clears throat> knew what Paul was in Paul's heart when he said, all things work together for good to them that love God. Thomas thought he was going to go to Jerusalem and get killed. That wasn't the plan. We see things happening in our lives and we wring our hands and we, 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 we <clears throat> fret, we worry. I thought, well, what's, what, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? We need to just rely on God because God's already in control. God sees yesterday just as good as He sees tomorrow. Should have said He sees tomorrow as good as He sees yesterday. He's already there. We don't have to fret. We don't have to worry. We've got to submit ourselves to Him and let Him guide and direct us. What a difference would it have made if that Sanhedrin would have come together and, like they did in the book of Acts when they brought some before the council and old Gamaliel said, well... He said, you know what we could do? We could just wait and see what happens. If this thing comes to naught, there wasn't nothing to it to start with. And if it don't, we better not mess with it. But they didn't do that. They didn't want to lose what they had to follow Jesus. As Brother Anthony comes with a song this morning, I don't know your hearts and your minds, but if you're here this morning, and you're holding on to something to keep from following Jesus, let me guarantee you and reassure you that there's nothing you can hold on to ever be as precious as Him. So won't you come as we stand and as we sing.